for roundtable discussion. So please welcome back to the stage Bertrand Barrette. Um, and he, you've probably seen him outside, but he's going to come now on stage with a group of people. I have a few names here. One name is missing, but I have uh, Miriam, Miriam Bergval, Gary Saivi. I may have mispronounced that surname. Please welcome them to the stage. Carlos Espejel, who most people know. <laughs> and we have Alice, who is the name I was missing. We had your lovely talk yesterday. Lovely to welcome you Thank as well. Good afternoon. No. So, as we are the last uh, panel, uh, I'd like to start uh, by uh, an unconventional uh, way. And maybe to uh, thank and congratulate the organizers of this uh, super Space Resource Week, ESRIC, LSA, ESA. So, please, a big applause to them. <laughs> so, clearly, uh, you've managed to uh, put together uh, an inclusive community that is uh, willing to work together to create a new space age based on space resources utilization for the benefit of sustainability in space and on Earth. And personally, if I have two magic words that I will uh, take away for this week, it's collaboration and coordination. And certainly, that's two core values that we have to engrave in our DNA if we want this endeavor to happen for the benefit of humankind. Collaboration and coordination at international level, because we are speaking about the human good, and uh, we are uh, speaking, uh, uh, and more than ever, we need a peaceful project uh, that would bring all together uh, the nations, for this will rely on our heads of space agency, but also our state members, and coordination and collaboration at industrial level, because uh, we are speaking about a new massive and multidisciplinary industry that does not exist yet. So that's exactly the, the topic of this panel, uh, to highlight the efforts of early pioneers from both space and Earth industry that are currently paving the way of this new lunar ecosystem, that are driving innovation of technology, of business models, to meet the future demand for the exploration, extraction, and utilization of lunar resources. So to speak about this and how this fits in a global value chain, please welcome Carlos Esperel, ISRU leader for iSpace, Miriam Bergval, Business Development Manager for Epiroc. Alice Wheeler, VP Space at Helios. And uh, Carl Pardanains, Pardanains, sorry for the, the, <laughs> the misspelling, partner at Elvinger Os Prussen. And on my side, I'm uh, Bertrand Barat, Director of the Space Market for Early Kid, uh, which is a, a gas and cryogenic world leader for the last uh, 120 years. And hopefully, uh, we would like to help also on this moon uh, endeavor. So, uh, please, uh, or uh, dear speaker, uh, can you present your uh, company uh, very briefly, uh, Technology and Services? Sure. I can maybe start. Just a clicker. Will miss something? Yeah. Uh, do you have this? Yeah. Perfect. So that's, yeah, we need to improvise. Huh? We are in space resources world. So, uh, so Carlos, maybe can you start? Oh, yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Bertrand. So I'm Carlos Espejel. I am the ISRU lead for iSpace. And I've been part of the iSpace adventure for the last uh, five years, uh, very proudly. And before being part of iSpace, I actually work for the mining industry for companies as Glencore uh, Extrata and BHP as a strategic mine planner, which in reality is a value chain uh, engineer. And yeah, it's been so far a really good adventure. Now. In iSpace, we were founded in 2010 with more than 210 uh, employees, and our vision is to expand the planet and expand the future through the utilization of space resources. And that's the reason why we are 
here today. Now, at the same time, I would like to mention that we're a global lunar exploration and transportation company, and we are very proudly to be an international and multicultural company. So our headquarters are in Tokyo, but we have a second biggest office in the US, and we have our third office here in Luxembourg, where we are developing exploration technology, but proudly multicultural and multinational. Now, among our latest uh, achievements, we launched last year in December 2022. We are uh, on lunar orbit at the moment, and we were listed in the Tokyo Stock Exchange just on the 12th of April. So we invite you to look at our uh, press releases. If we can please go to the next uh, slide, thanks. And of course, we're very proud to share that we reached space in December last year, and we reached uh, lunar orbit uh, just a few weeks ago. And as you heard just before, we will be attempting landing next Tuesday at 6.40 uh, CET. So we ask you to please uh, cross fingers for us and to follow us live in, in YouTube. Thanks very much, uh, Carlos. Maybe Miriam, uh, can you yep. present the Piroc? Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, my name is Miriam Berival. I work as a business development manager at uh, Epiroc, and I mainly focus on partnerships and uh, acquisitions. Uh, Epiroc is a Swedish company, and we uh, develop and manufacture uh, equipment for mining and infrastructure. Uh, we also provide solutions for uh, automation, digitalization, and electrification. Uh, we are a global company with uh, approximately 17,000 employees. Uh, we uh, serve uh, customers in 150 countries. Our core values are innovation, commitment, and collaboration. And uh, we like to say that innovation is part of our DNA. And uh, our vision is uh, dare to think new. So that's a little bit about us. Alice. Okay, hello everybody. After the 70,000 employees, we're down to 30. So I'm from Helios in Israel, a startup company. Uh, we've been alive for four years, which is a great achievement. And uh, we have managed to secure a pre-A round of $13 million, which is fantastic. And most of our money is coming from private investors not because of the space, as I presented earlier, but because we have found a fantastic terrestrial application. One more slide, please. Yeah, so I've presented this in length yesterday. I won't uh, talk about it too much, but uh, we produce oxygen on the lunar surface and get metals, including iron, as a byproduct. Uh, so some engineer invented a system by which we can produce iron and get oxygen as a byproduct, saving millions of tons of carbon dioxide per year uh, for the steel industry. So that is where our funding is coming from now, but we're here to talk about space. So, yeah. Hello, so uh, I'm Karl Pardens. I'm a lawyer at uh, Luxembourg law firm uh, Elvinger Rosprussen. We are a law firm of approximately 480 people with offices in uh, Luxembourg, New York, Paris, and Hong Kong. We assist uh, companies active in the space industry in relation to all the different uh, legal aspects, starting from the incorporation, employment law issue, real estate, lease, etc. More importantly, most of the time, of course, uh, financing, a relationship with the different investors, joint venture agreement, listing, uh, banking facility. In the worst case scenario, bankruptcy, but uh, hopefully not that often. Uh, and of course, particularity of Luxembourg, since we also have laws on um, the uh, utilization of space resources, exploration, and uh, space activities, we also provide legal advice in relation to those, to those that uh, are quite innovative uh, from not only a European, but also a worldwide perspective, and is, in my view, one of the reasons why Luxembourg is so successful in that respect. So thanks very much, uh, the four of you. So as we've discussed uh, for the last three days, uh, we've seen that uh, space resources uh, utilization is about implementing a new value chain, and it's about collaboration between uh, nations, between institutions, between industry from space and Earth. Um, on the screen, uh, we've tried to illustrate uh, an example of end-to-end -end value chain. 
So uh, could you please, uh, the four of us, uh, explain uh, to the audience where your company is uh, fitting in that, uh, in, into, the, into this, uh, this illustration? So Carlos, maybe you can start. Sure, uh, Bertrand. Uh, so within iSpace, we're doing a number of activities across the value chain. Uh, for instance, we're actually doing market study evaluations internally and with partners where it's giving us an idea on what's the size of the supply and therefore what's the size of the deposit that we need to explore and extract in the future. So we're having activities on number one on project evaluation and on number two on exploration, uh, concretely here in Luxembourg, we're developing uh, exploration rovers to, uh, for the acquisition of resources data, but we're not only working on the acquisition of these resources data, but on the processing and analysis to develop resource evaluation uh, studies. Now, as well on 4.1, we are developing with a partner an extraction system. We cannot speak too much about it yet. Um, but most important, we're working on number six, where we're looking after the contract, where we can actually supply a commodity to a, an end customer. And a concrete example of that is the two NASA contracts that we have for the transfer of ownership of Regolith. Uh, Sato-san just previously spoke about it. We will be using Japanese uh, resources law on that. And for the second one, we're going to be using the space resources law of Luxembourg. Of course, those contracts are small, but they are a concrete step forward. Let's continue this way. Yes, and when it comes to EPROC, I would say that it fits very well into the value chain as well. Uh, we, uh, we do have uh, both a lot of knowledge and technology within exploration and extraction and to some extent also within infrastructure. Uh, we are uh, market leaders when it comes to drilling and we have a large portfolio of uh, loaders and trucks as well. And we continuously um, develop new technologies in order to expand our product uh, offering. And Helios, of course, is in 4.2. We do the processing, uh, also some refining. But I must say that we always go back to the project evalu evaluation because you always have to see like why you're doing what you're doing. And then we come back to the processing again and look again why we're doing what we're doing, especially looking at the long term and at the scale up of what we're doing. From a legal perspective, obviously, we are everywhere, but uh, the only challenging part is in relation to uh, item four, I would say, where, again, Luxembourg, with its two specific laws, uh, has also um, opened the door to uh, the legal analysis of uh, extraction, processing, uh, storage, etc., and activities on the moon. We'll discuss it in two further detail, obviously, because Luxembourg is not the only country in the world. Thanks. Uh, so now I have a question for uh, Carlos and Alice uh, about uh, enlarging this value chain. Uh, we have uh, here uh, four uh, early pioneers. So according to you, Carlos and Alice, how important uh, is a collaboration with other companies, other organizations in the space and earth industry for the success of this global uh, space resources uh, implementation? Well, collaboration is imperative. I mean, it, it's a must. I mean, uh, there is not going to be an entity or a company that can do the end-to-end -end of the value chain. Uh, so collaboration is imperative. And just going back to the mining industry, uh, someone like Glencore, like Rio Tinto, they get a contract to supply thousands of tons of copper per year, but then they have to collaborate and hire exploration companies to do geophysics, EPCMs to do the infrastructure, uh, going to companies like Epiroc to get extraction uh, systems, and so on, and work with like legal uh, companies like EHP for execution of contracts, and so on. So it's in, collaboration is imperative. Uh, however, just by looking at the panel so far, uh, we can already identify some gaps just now. Like I would see a gap on refining and storage, and I believe that's technology that Air Liquid is working on. Uh, so this is an indirect invitation for Air Liquid to jump on the boat to collaborate, or better say to jump on the lander on the next missions. Um, I, nobody can say the sentence, no collaboration is needed. You know, everybody knows there's no way of going to space on your own. That's not going to happen. But something which I've been cooking in my mind for some time now, and it's being strengthened by uh, this conference, is the understanding that we really have to kind of uh, change a record in our heads. You know, because we're very used to, especially, companies that are doing intensive R&D, 
we're very used to keeping everything close to our chest. And I feel it's time that we open up a little bit because uh, the company that's going to be doing oxygen on the moon or anything else is not going to be the company that has the best material for their crucible. It's not going to be that. We have to be able to fund it. We have to be able to go the whole, the whole way. And I think that sharing information in a much more open way, okay, we can protect our IPs, don't worry. But finding a way to share information is something which we have to change. You know, up there it's not the same as down here. And I think we have to change our disk here regarding uh, the way we do our collaboration. Yeah. So I think at least you, you're making the perfect transition uh, for uh, Carl and Miriam. So I, I fully agree with you. Uh, technology uh, is certainly not the main thing. Uh, innovation uh, is about also a way of doing things. And here, the value chain we have on the screen is uh, quite complex. Uh, we are going to implement uh, fully new uh, ways of working, interacting between the people, cross nations, cross institutions, cross industry. So, uh, Carl and, uh, and Miriam, uh, you certainly have some experience to share on a very complex terrestrial uh, consortium uh, that could be uh, replicated uh, and utilized for space. Could you share with us uh, some experience? Well, of course, in Luxembourg, the advantage is that for years and years there's been a small country, but uh, with huge uh, um, implications in terms of uh, international investments. I think that uh, there is hardly uh, one Luxembourg company that has no international investors and is composed of 100% of Luxembourg employees. Therefore, the expertise, but also the legal environment is there in terms of joint venture, consortium, or you can set up the company, or you can protect your IP right, or you can protect your assets, or you can be financed. Uh, all of that is well tested. So I believe that in terms of cooperation on Earth, we are already there. The missing part, of course, is cooperation or legal environment or safe legal environment for the investors about what's taking place on the moon or when you are not on Earth. Um, maybe I can comment really quick. Uh, coming from the mining industry, uh, big operations like in South America, huge deposits. Uh, not one company does it on their own. For instance, sometimes a joint venture, a consortium between a clear example, Glencore, PHP, Rio Tinto, and Mitsubishi. And they all share the capital and share the, the benefits. Uh, so that could be something we could replicate as well for space. Okay, so thanks very much for, uh, for that. Now we are uh, going to speak about uh, industry engagement. I like the words that were used by the, the, pa the panelists just before. Uh, we need to uh, maximize benefits and minimize the risk. Uh, basically, if we want to engage Earth industry, uh, we need to accelerate towards the implementation of commercial services. And uh, we need uh, to uh, define a path for that. So uh, a way to reduce uh, the, tradi the traditional space innovation cycles is certainly uh, by organizing tech demo. Uh, maybe, Carlos, uh, you could uh, give a word uh, to the audience on, uh, on your opinion on what would be uh, the right tech demo uh, to uh, showcase the potential of lunar uh, value chain to investors and stakeholders and accelerate uh, the, the implementation of this new business? Uh, sure. Uh, well, I personally believe that uh, it would be extremely valuable that maybe taking a, a step further, instead of a tech demo, to do an actual end-to-end -end value, chain, value chain initial service, where we industry already go in the production of the first liter of oxygen on the moon, or the first uh, kilowatt of power on the moon. I, Truly, truly believe we can already do this as soon as 2026, 2027, to demonstrate this as industry. And concretely, uh, for instance, we can already have access to the moon. We can use an exploration rover from iSpace, as an example, using technology, for example, as from EpiRock, where we can uh, explore for mineral oxides and extract those mineral oxides, put them in a processing plant from Helios, for example, extract the oxygen, 
pass the oxygen to a refining and storage plant from early kit once they jump on the lander, and then, of course, working together uh, with companies as EHP to execute uh, the contracts. But uh, again, I think we are ready to go and demonstrate an end-to-end -end initial service as soon as 2026, 2027. And can you give us an example of a recent tech demo on which iSpace has been uh, working? Uh, sure. Uh, so we have been working on an activity that has two fronts. Uh, so the first one, the first front we're trying to demonstrate uh, is a tech demo uh, on 4.1 on extraction. Again, we cannot speak too much about it. And the second front is on the legal demonstration, as my colleague Sato San was speaking. On the tech demo, we are developing with a partner an extraction system to actively collect 50 grams of regulate and sell that to NASA. That's the technical part. And we, what we have been working so far is for more than 50 grams, of course. And the second part of it is the legal demonstration where we're gonna be transferring the ownership of the regulate uh, using, if everything goes well, maybe using for the first time the famous space resources law of Luxembourg. And we could be doing this together with companies potentially as EHP. And um, so this is two specific activities that we're working on, on a tech demo for the extraction of regulate and the legal part of the transfer of ownership. So these two together make a concrete step forward uh, for the ISRU ecosystem. Thanks, Carlos. Uh, question to Miriam. Uh, we've seen that the way to accelerate is also to leverage the more we can on uh, existing talents uh, for not reinventing the wheel. So clearly, uh, collaboration between space and uh, Earth industry will be key. Uh, could you eventually share some example of uh, starting collaboration uh, with, from APROC with, uh, with the space uh, resources industry, industry? Yes, absolutely. Uh, very recently, just a few weeks ago, we signed a long-term uh, collaboration agreement with uh, iSpace. And this is something that uh, we as a company is uh, very excited about, uh, of course. And uh, what it actually means is that uh, we, Epiroc, together with iSpace, uh, will uh, collaborate to uh, develop and provide uh, technologies for uh, Moon uh, commercial moon uh, projects. Uh, we can unfortunately not say so much right now what it is that we are working together on, but uh, it will come soon. But uh, what I can say is that we will uh, start to explore the moon surface and the goal is to expand and support human life in a, in a sustainable way. So that's what it's mainly about. Good news, mining and space uh, together. Alice, uh, another way to accelerate uh, the development of commercial usage is uh, to see, uh, to develop uh, application in a dual way uh, in between uh, Earth and space application. In other words, to maximize spin-in, spin-off. Would you have uh, an example to share with us? I feel it's getting a little boring. I spoke about it yesterday. I'll speak about it again today. But yes, you know, that just happened to us very well because we knew we have to have a terrestrial application. So we were developing our space application and we, f we were searching for something we can utilize on Earth. And we found a process to produce uh, iron uh, using an alkali metal, which reduces the oxygen from the iron ore, produces, for, uh, just for example, like sodium oxide, then we uh, break that down into sodium and oxygen, send the oxygen up to uh, the atmosphere and put the sodium back into the system, reducing zero direct carbon dioxide emissions. And uh, this is a very great thing because 10% of the carbon dioxide emissions on Earth come from the steel industry. And if we can help cut that off, uh, it can be a fantastic thing for Earth and can be a fantastic way for us to pave our way uh, to the moon, yeah. Yeah, very exciting. Uh, and also crossing the energy transition objective. So I think that's, uh, that's another tick uh, that you can add on your, uh, on your box. And Carl, uh, a question for you, uh, maybe to, uh, to enlighten us. Uh, what we have to uh, implement on the screen uh, will be very complex. Uh, whereas today, uh, we are all working in silos. Uh, clearly, we have to work cross nations, cross institutions, cross export control regulations, 
uh, we have to open up a, a bit of, uh, of our IP if we would like to, uh, to go ahead. So uh, on a legal and a regulatory uh, standpoint, uh, would you have some recommendation to make to facilitate transversality in those uh, collaborative uh, relationships? Well, uh, long, long, long subject, just uh, one minute. Yes. <laughs> So I believe in short that so long as you remain on Earth, uh, that's quite well tested, and I think that everything works more or less. Um, the issue is that once you will operate or once you will extract something, a few grams or regulate or whatever on the moon, um, that's where the questions really start. Because um, at this stage, unlike, for instance, the Antarctic, we don't really have any uh, treaty that will be binding on all uh, the operant or or even uh, countries of the, of the world. Uh, and to give you just two very short examples, you were mentioning intellectual property. Uh, today, it's far from being clear what's the status of any invention or discovery that will be made on the moon. We know what happens on the Earth, but on the moon, that's subject to some questions. Um, in terms of extraction or exploration, uh, even within the European Union, uh, if you take Belgium and Luxembourg, we are not uh, within the, the exact same legal environment, which means basically that uh, even if you do something in accordance with the Luxembourg laws on exploration and use of special resources, it may not be recognized by Belgium. So what happens if you bring it back one day and uh, one country says, belongs to me or does not belong to you? Um, so it's just to say that, um, as Stephen mentioned, uh, but I disagree a little bit, we need also to fix those issues. Um, and where I disagree is that I do not believe that you can say that you have 20 years uh, to put something in place uh, between the different uh, governments on Earth. Because in my opinion, it's better to have a treaty, even if it's not perfect, than no treaty at all, or as we have uh, with the Artemis Accord, something which is not signed by China, uh, India, Russia, and the like. Uh, investors, don't make any uh, profitable uh, investment outside of a clear legal environment. So I believe that for the moment we can live with the current legal environment because there are only a very limited amount of players who are going to reach and land on the moon. But uh, if the situation improves in 15 or 20 years, maybe a bit late to only start uh, implementing some legal environment. Uh, in my op that's my opinion, but uh, we'll see. Okay, thanks so much. So um, uh, we are getting uh, to the end of, uh, of this panel. Uh, we, I'd like uh, still to ask uh, one uh, last question to, uh, to the panelists, uh, but we'll go very quick. Um, to introduce it, uh, I'd like to say and remind that the traditional way of doing business on Earth is always to wait for the demand. Uh, to be established and then after to make business plan and then to invest and then uh, okay to roll up the offer here uh, finally we're uh, breaking uh, the chicken and egg uh, paradigm uh, we have to start by building the infrastructure in parallel uh, to uh, start about uh, the standards the regulation so it's a bit of an improvisation uh, still, we are lucky to have around the table some early pathfinders, some early pioneers that are opening the way. So we need to encourage them uh, to continue uh, and certainly to uh, synchronize uh, the demand and the offer. Because those guys, uh, they will uh, build the offer and the infrastructure and the demand will come after. So if you had a magic stick uh, in 15 minutes, uh, 15 uh, seconds each, sorry, just to close the, the panel and, and, uh, and relieve uh, the, the people. What would you ask to the audience as a, let's say, a, a key priority to help you in your uh, endeavor? So, Carlos. So, if I have a magic stick and 15 seconds, so I would ask for an anchor customer. And I still truly believe that a space agency, a government, should be putting the first anchor contract for the first liter of production of oxygen, the first kilowatt uh, on the moon, the industry is, is ready to start executing that as long, I mean, as soon as 2026, 2027. And this will accelerate technology development, this will give confidence to the market, and will accelerate the ESRU ecosystem. Yes, and I would uh, ask for information, for more data, 
uh, in order for us to develop the right uh, products or technology, we need to understand what the requirements are. And this is, of course, very difficult since it's uh, very limited. And uh, so that's something that I would like to have. And, uh, and then uh, it's also because of the investments. It's quite a lot of money that, uh, that's invested. And if we, we knew more, we would also be able to go in better in, uh, in the projects, better prepared and with better solutions. So being from a startup, I always talk about funding. <laughs> we need funding. And I feel that, uh, you know, in the automotive industry, uh, a company doesn't have to de develop an electric car and the roads for the car to drive on. You know, we're developing oxygen production and we have to pay for the journey to the moon. I would like somebody here, if I have to ask the audience and I have a magic stick, to please help us fund our experiments on the moon. I think if governments would help fund um, the, the journey, you know, just putting something on the moon, we would be able to accelerate our development like tenfold. Well, my experience is that there is plenty of money in the market, but people only invest, only invest once they have a clear legal environment. So my advice would rather be to your, to your respective governments to move forward as soon as possible to have a treaty which is binding on all the major uh, countries in the world. I think that once we have a clear legal system, money won't be a problem. So it's time to conclude and uh, to uh, finish this panel, uh, we'd like to share uh, with you and uh, the audience one final thought for you to be able to get back home from Darwin. In the long history of humankind, those who learn to collaborate and improvise the most effectively have prevailed. So that's exactly what we have to do all together in a coordinated way. So let's do it. And thanks very much. <laughs>